In the last episode in this series on the introduction to apologetics, we saw that there's good reason to think that our copies of the New Testament are accurate to the originals, that we have, in essence, what the writers initially communicated. In this episode, we begin to answer the next important question. Is the New Testament historically reliable? That is, is the New Testament a reliable witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Now, it's important to get clear on the question at hand. To do this, let's first distinguish the question of general reliability from a couple of related questions that we are definitely not seeking to address here. We're not going to be making the case that the New Testament represents the inspired Word of God, and there's two basic reasons for this. First, as a matter of apologetical method, we don't need to demonstrate that the New Testament is the inspired Word of God to show that it is generally reliable, trustworthy, and therefore probably true in what it records. If it is generally trustworthy and probably true, then we'll have good reason to think that Christianity is true, and this wholly apart from the question of whether it is also inspired. And second, although the question of the divine inspiration of the New Testament is an important question, it's not one um, for apologetics per se, but it's rather a question for theology. That is, it's a question about what the testimony of the New Testament requires us to believe about itself. We're also not going to be making the case that the New Testament is inerrant or without any factual errors of any kind, or even infallible or without any theological errors of any kind. Again, as a matter of method, the New Testament does not need to be inerrant or infallible to be generally reliable, and therefore probably true in what it records. Obviously, a book or written source can be generally reliable and accurate, even if it contains some errors. The question of inerrancy or infallibility are themselves corollaries to the doctrine of divine inspiration of the New Testament. And as we saw, that is a question of theology, not of apologetics. So for our purposes here, all we want to know is whether the New Testament collectively represents a historically reliable witness and generally truthful testimony to the teachings and the events surrounding the person of Jesus Christ. The goal here, then, is not to resolve every tension in the New Testament or to smooth out every discrepancy or to counter every claim of contradiction or historical inaccuracy. Again, and to repeat once more, the question is not whether the New Testament is inspired or inerrant. The question is whether the New Testament is generally reliable and trustworthy as a source of information about Jesus and the early Christian movement. We're looking for reasons which support general, factual reliability. The subject of New Testament reliability is a massive one today, and there's been a library of good scholarly work produced in this area by first-rate New Testament scholars. The case that can be made for the trustworthiness of the New Testament from both external support and internal textual considerations is extensive. It is detailed, and in my opinion, it's powerful. But because this series is only an introduction to apologetics, I'm going to uh, simply provide a high-level overview of the basic case for New Testament reliability. And to do this, we'll organize our review around three important claims. The first is that the New Testament writers were able to write a reliable account. The second is that the New Testament writers intended to write a reliable account. And the third is that the New Testament writers did, in fact, write a reliable account. Okay, so let's start with the first claim, that the New Testament writers were able to write a reliable account. Here we want to know whether the authors of the New Testament were the right people, writing from the right place, and writing at the right time. In other words, we want to know whether the New Testament documents— were written close enough to the events that they describe, and by people who were in a position to know whether the events described actually happened. And here we'll focus on just two questions. First, when were the documents written? And second, who wrote them? To simplify this review, we're just going to concern ourselves with the four canonical Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Book of Acts, and the Epistles and Letters of the Apostle Paul. These works, after all, make up most of the New Testament. 
So let's start with dating. When were these New Testament documents written? Well, as a general statement in answer to this question, we can say that there is near unanimous agreement among New Testament scholars, both conservative and liberal, that the entirety of the New Testament was written within the first century AD. This means that no matter how we end up dating the particular documents, the New Testament as a whole was written within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses to the events that it records. And this, of course, is of the highest importance since the documents would have been produced at a time when there were people around who had firsthand knowledge of the facts surrounding the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This community of eyewitnesses, which would have included the apostles, would have acted as a natural restraint on any tendencies to embellish the traditions about Jesus. Okay, so let's take a look at the various writings to see if we can't be more specific as to their dating. For the sake of dating, we'll say that the crucifixion of Jesus happened in the year 30 AD. Now, I know that some prefer a date of 33 AD, but we'll leave this question of the exact dating of the crucifixion to one side. Let's begin with the epistles of Paul, since there exists considerable agreement here. It's widely acknowledged that the letters of Paul represent the earliest written sources of information about the early Christian movement that we have today. Fortunately, dating Paul's epistles is not that difficult, since there are many clues to the relevant events, places, and times within the epistles themselves that can be cross-checked with external historical and archaeological data, as well as the chronicle of Paul's ministry that we have in the book of Acts. Putting this all together, scholars are confident that Paul's epistles were written between the late 40s to 60s AD, which means that Paul's epistles were composed within 20 to 40 years of Jesus' crucifixion. Now, historically speaking, Paul's writing are pretty much as close as ancient historical accounts get to the events that they report. Of course, most of what we know about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus comes from the gospel accounts. So how close are they to the events that they report? Here, there is widespread disagreement among scholars. The most common dates for the gospels range between the 50s and the 90s AD. Conservative dates for the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, typically put their composition in the late 50s or early 60s, while common liberal dates for them are between the mid-60s to the mid-80s. When it comes to the Gospel of John, most date it to the 90s, although there are some scholars, a minority of scholars, who have argued for a composition of John that is prior to AD 70. Now, a lot has been made over the debate between the earlier and the later dates proposed by New Testament scholars, but in my opinion, the significance of this question is rather overblown. The fact is, even if we assume the later dates are the correct ones, the Gospels were still written well within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses. And remember, when I say eyewitnesses, we're talking about both friendly and unfriendly eyewitnesses. And they were still written, even if we assume the later dates, well within a reasonable time frame for general factual reliability. Having said this, I do think that there are very compelling reasons to prefer the earlier dates given for the Synoptic Gospels, especially if, as is widely believed, the Gospel of Mark was written first. By far, the prevailing view today is that Mark was used as source material for both Matthew and Luke, so that one way to get a date of composition for the Gospel of Mark is by starting with the Gospel of Matthew or Luke and then working backwards. Consider the Gospel of Luke. Luke was written by the same author who wrote the book of Acts. But the book of Acts was almost certainly written well before 70 AD. We know this because Acts ends abruptly with the Apostle Paul under house arrest in Rome. Acts doesn't mention or include massively consequential events that happened later than Paul's imprisonment. Events such as Paul's trial before Caesar, which was, after all, the very reason that Paul was in Rome in the first place. It doesn't mention the martyrdom of the brother of Jesus, James, who was a chief leader in the Jerusalem church. It doesn't mention the Neronian persecutions, which was a massive event that uh, involved Christians in Rome 
And it doesn't mention, uh, most importantly of all, the siege and destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, which took place in AD 70. Now, it's extremely hard to believe that the author of Acts would have left these hugely important uh, events out of his chronicle if he knew about them. So far and away, the best explanation is that the author of Acts concluded his account while Paul was imprisoned in Rome around circa AD 60, and therefore before these other events took place. In other words, Acts doesn't include these other events simply because they hadn't been, they hadn't happened when Acts itself was completed. Now, since the Gospel of Luke was written before Acts, and since both Luke and Acts were written by the same author, the Gospel of Luke had to be written earlier than circa AD 60, and it was most likely written sometime in the 50s. But since Luke uses Mark as one source in his own Gospel account, the Gospel of Mark itself had to be written even earlier. So it seems to me that in all probability, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were all written prior to AD 60. And that's just within 30 years of the crucifixion. In fact, in his recent book, Rethinking the Dates of the New Testament, The Evidence for Early Composition, scholar Jonathan Bernier argues that the Gospel of Mark ought to be dated to 42 to 45 AD. And if he's right, that would be just over a decade after the death of Jesus. But as I've said, the debate over the precise range for gospel composition is not as important as some people make it out to be, since virtually everyone agrees that the gospels were written in a time when a lot of the people who witnessed the events described were still alive. Moreover, regardless of when the gospels themselves were composed, we know that the source material that was used by the gospel authors for their accounts would have had to exist even earlier than the gospels themselves. There's every reason to believe that some of the source material behind the gospel accounts went all the way back to the ministry of Jesus, or just after his crucifixion. Although some of this earlier source material may very well have been in written form, it is certain that some of the source material existed in the form of a regulated oral tradition. It's well known that the first century Jewish culture was an oral culture. Memory was relied upon and developed much more in the first century world than it is today. Memory was especially prized in the context of Jewish religious training and education. From the earliest ages, young children were taught to memorize sacred tradition, and students were taught to memorize the teachings of their rabbis. It wasn't uncommon for young Jewish men to memorize the entirety of the Torah. And moreover, the Jews had a strictly regulated system for the transmission of sacred oral tradition that was highly developed and highly reliable. Now, there is simply no doubt that the Jewish disciples of Jesus would have treated his teachings and his deeds with the same kind of care. In fact, we can find parts of this well-preserved oral tradition within the New Testament itself in the form of what scholars have called a creedal tradition. We find creeds, which are just formalized oral sayings in the New Testament in the form of hymns, confessions, creeds, and sermon summaries that were in use by the early church and then incorporated into the text of the New Testament by the various New Testament authors. Scholars have identified dozens of these creeds within the New Testament. Some uh, have said there are as many as 40 or 50 of these creeds, and they vary from statements that con uh, consist of a single verse to statements that are several verses long. Now, this creedal tradition within the New Testament is extremely important for two reasons. First, the content of these creeds is almost always related to the central truth claims of the Christian faith. Some have estimated that up to 75 to 80 percent of these creeds have to do with the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The second reason why they're important is because how early they are. Obviously, if the New Testament writers incorporated them into their texts, if they included them within their own writings, then the creedal tradition itself had to predate those writings. What we have then within the text of the New Testament are very early sources of information about Jesus within the sources that make up the New Testament. 
Now, how old are these creeds? How old is this creedal tradition? Well, scholars have dated these creedal traditions to the 30s and 40s AD. They therefore represent our earliest sources of information about Jesus. To help us appreciate the significance of this creedal tradition within the text of the New Testament, let's briefly look at what is undoubtedly the most studied creed in the New Testament, which is the one passed on to us by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3-7. through 7. Here Paul writes, quote, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. End quote. Although there is some scholarly dispute about exactly where this cre uh, creed ends, everybody agrees that Paul is here passing on an early formalized statement that was circulating among the earliest Christian community. Paul makes this fact plain when he says that he's delivering or he's re-delivering something that he himself had received. Now, actually, what Paul's doing here is he's reminding the Corinthians of a creed that he himself had passed to them on a prior occasion, that is, at a time prior to the writing of this letter. Now, scholars have noted that the Greek words uh, that Paul uses here are technical words that were used for the formal passing on of rabbinic traditions. Consider the content of this creed. Paul says that it pertains to what is of first importance. Notice that the creed recites the central elements and facts of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died, he was buried, then he was raised. The creed then recites a series of appearances made by the risen Jesus to various individuals and groups of people. So here in this early Christian creed, we have a formalized statement regarding the central claim of Christianity. The question relevant to our purposes here is this. Just how old is this creed? Well, without going into all the details of why scholars date the creed the way that they do, let me just report that virtually all New Testament scholars, that's liberal and conservative alike, date this creed to within two to five years of the events it describes, with some scholars suggesting that this creed was formulated within months of Jesus' death. This means that we have early eyewitness historical information about Jesus, including information related to his death and burial, as well as resurrection appearances that go all the way back to the events that they report. In terms of sources for ancient historical events, it just doesn't get any better or closer than this. Okay, let's talk about authorship. Who wrote these New Testament documents? The people who wrote the New Testament documents were well-placed to provide a trustworthy witness of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We have every reason to believe that they were related or connected to the events that they describe, and that they were therefore in good position to know whether what they were reporting was in fact true. For the sake of simplicity, we will once again focus on the authorship of the Gospels and Acts and the writings of Paul in particular. So let's start with the Gospels. It's fashionable today to doubt the authorship of the four Gospels. And in one sense, the impulse to do this is understandable, since the Gospel accounts themselves do not include the names of their authors within the texts. But although the Gospels are technically anonymous, since they don't mention the author in the body of the text, there's good reason to doubt that they were functionally anonymous, or to doubt that they were intended to be understood as anonymous in the early Christian community. In other words, the authors of the Gospels were not mysterious figures in the first century, but were instead well-known and widely acknowledged, acknowledged to be the works of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first thing to note here is that other works from the same general period were also technically anonymous, yet we still know who wrote them. For example, there is uh, the Life of Demonax, written by Lucian, and, and then the Vita, written by Josephus. Both of these works, they lack authorship claims within the body of the text, but they were nevertheless intended to be known as the works of these authors. In cases like these, the names of the authors could be noted with a brief title affixed to the outside of the scroll. 
And there's every reason to believe that the same procedure would have been used to demarcate the authorship of the Gospels. The key point here is this. Just because the name of the author doesn't appear in the body of the text, this doesn't mean that the text was meant to be anonymous. There were other ways that one could indicate authorship. But more importantly, the testimony of the early church uniformly confirms the authorship of the Gospels as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. None of the earliest ancient writers thought that the Gospels were actually anonymous. If the Gospels were actually intended to be anonymous, if the original authors were actually unknown, we would certainly expect to find various names being attached to these works as they were, as they were being copied and circulated. This is, in fact, just what we do find with the New Testament letter to the Hebrews. But when it comes to the Gospels, the names associated with them have always been the same four in the earliest ancient sources. There is simply no contrary evidence from the earliest sources, that is, sources before 200 AD, that the Gospel authors were known by any other names or that the identity of the authors were ever debated. In summary, then, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were consistently and universally attested as the authors of the four Gospels from the earliest period, and they were without competitors. But who were these guys? Do they actually qualify as good sources of information about Jesus? Irenaeus of Lyons represents the early testimony of the Church regarding the identity of the Gospel authors, when in circa AD 180 he writes, quote, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their dialect while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Afterward, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia, end quote. Matthew and John, of course, were of the original 12 disciples of Jesus, and as such, they were eyewitnesses of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew, we learned from his gospel, was a tax collector, and John was the beloved disciple who was among the three innermost disciples of Jesus with Peter and James. We also know that he was the son of Zebedee. Mark and Luke were not themselves eyewitnesses of Jesus, but they were close associates to those who were eyewitnesses of Jesus. Mark is traditionally believed to have been John Mark, who's mentioned throughout the New Testament. It was John Mark who abandoned Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and over whom Paul and Barnabas had a dispute and eventually a breakup. Tradition has it that Mark became the interpreter for the Apostle Peter, and the gospel that Mark wrote is basically that which was preached by the Apostle Peter. Luke was the travel companion of Paul and was associated with other eyewitnesses of Jesus. And as we've seen, he wrote both the gospel that bears his name, as well as the book of Acts, which together comprises nearly 25% of the New Testament. Now, as an aside, I think that the traditional identity of the gospel writers, aside from John, provides added support for their authorship. Now, why think that? Well, consider that if you were looking to write a gospel account, and pass it off under someone else's identity. You probably wouldn't be choosing Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Think about it. Though Matthew was a disciple of Jesus, he was among the less well-known disciples. He had also been a Jewish tax collector for Rome, not exactly a profession that would have made him popular among his peers. So Matthew would not have been the best choice. Not only was Mark not an apostle, but he also abandoned the apostle Paul along with Barnabas during their first missionary journey. He bailed on them. So for these reasons, Mark too would have been a poor choice for a forged authorship. Like Mark, Luke was also a non-apostle, and moreover, he was somewhat of an obscure figure. And as such, he would be an unlikely name to assign to writings which comprise nearly a whole quarter of the New Testament. If you were looking to pass off a work of fictitious authorship, there were far better candidates than Matthew, Mark, and Luke to choose from. 
For example, why not choose Peter, who seemed to have been the chief of the apostles? Or choose either one of the James. James, the brother of Jesus. Obviously, he was the brother of Jesus. He would have made for a great author of one of the Gospels. Or James, the apostle, who was one of the inner three disciples. So it just doesn't make sense that if you're setting out to write a forgery, you're going to choose Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Much of the New Testament is claimed to have been written by the apostle Paul. There are 13 letters in which Paul is explicitly named as the author. That Paul was indeed the writer of the letters that bear his name was widely accepted by the early Christian community. Moreover, even the most skeptical of biblical scholars today recognize at least seven of the 13 letters as being undisputedly Pauline. And among them are Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians, which are some of the most theologically important and, as we'll see later, the most historically important of Paul's letters. Everyone agrees, then, that Paul wrote much of the New Testament. So we can ask again, who was Paul? And does he qualify as a good source of information about Jesus? Well, Paul himself tells us that he was a very early convert to Christianity, and that he was also a direct eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. His conversion experience is told multiple times in the book of Acts. In addition to witnessing the risen Christ for himself, an event which resulted in his own conversion, Paul also had contact and was in fellowship with some of the original 12 disciples of Jesus, such as Peter, and others who knew Jesus, such as uh, James, the brother of Jesus. Paul was one of the eminent apostles for the church, as well as a missionary, especially to the Gentiles. And he was eventually martyred for his witness to Christ. It really is hard to overestimate the power of Paul's testimony to Christ in the New Testament. Before his conversion, Paul was called Saul, and he belonged to the Jewish sect of Pharisees. On their behalf, he became the chief enemy of the early Christian movement in Jerusalem. And on their authority, he engaged in a passionate and violent persecution of Christians. We read in Acts that Paul was present and consented to the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. After persecuting the church in Jerusalem, Paul was sent by the religious authorities to do the same in Damascus. It was on the road to Damascus where Paul encountered the risen Jesus, an event that would transform the greatest enemy of the early Christian movement into its greatest defender. It is absolutely remarkable that so much of the New Testament comes from a man who was at one time the single greatest enemy of Jesus and of the Jesus movement. In summary, then, we can see that the New Testament writers were well able to write a reliable account. The writers of the New Testament wrote close enough to the events that they described. The New Testament writings were all written during a period in which there would have been eyewitnesses who were still alive. And as we've seen, much of the New Testament was written within just decades of the crucifixion of Jesus. And some of the sources within the New Testament go back even earlier, all the way back to just after the crucifixion. Moreover, there is strong historical reason to regard the Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles of Paul as works that were produced directly by eyewitnesses or by associates of those who are eyewitnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus.